thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I am uh, I am honored to give this talk today. I was an undergraduate here at Tufts, and I took the lunch and learn class, which was like a semester long class where we attended 13 of these lectures. And I was sitting in the, the lecture hall and sometimes my mind would drift. And I daydream about being up here giving a talk on some topic. I didn't know what. Um, and so the fact that I get to talk about bees and in urban environments today is just uh, an absolute pleasure. Um, as an undergraduate at Tufts, I got to know campus really well. You know, I knew the buildings, the sidewalks, uh, the lawns, even off of campus in Davis Square in Boston. And after graduating, I thought I knew, I thought I knew the Tufts community pretty well, but there was one component missing, which was the biodiversity that I, I attended school alongside. And to give you a sense of what I was missing out during those four years, I want to zoom in to right at the end of the street, at the end of Boston Avenue and, and Harvard Street. If you go down there, you'll find a pocket, a pocket of green space. And if we zoom in a bit more and you're there at the right time of year, you'll find that there's a garden absolutely brimming with wildflowers, goldenrods and sunflowers and culver's fruit. And there's a veritable safari waiting to be seen in just a hundred feet of green space. You'll see charismatic herbivores like peck skippers and bumblebees. You'll see intrepid migrants like monarch butterflies that go from Massachusetts to Mexico. And you'll see drone flies that maybe don't make it as far, but still make an impressive journey for an organism the size of a black bean. And then you'll see fierce but harmless predators like bee wolves and golden digger wasps that look like they're about to sting you, but honestly wouldn't hurt a fly. These guys hunt katydids. All of these insects that we find in that garden are known as flower visiting insects. There's bees, hoverflies, butterflies and moths, beetles and wasps, and they visit flowers to collect food, nectar, which is sugar, and pollen, which is protein. In doing so, they ferry pollen grains between flowers and help plants reproduce. Plants can't move, and so they need a living mobile organism to play matchmaker. Animals that pollinate are responsible for 90% of wild plant reproduction and 75% of global top crops require animals for pollinators and their pollination. That's things like blueberries, pumpkins, coffee, chocolate. They stock our grocery aisles with a colorful panoply of fruits and vegetables and that are quite nutritious. And in a world without pollinators, our options would be far less diverse. Now, considering a world without pollinators is actually a reality we have to deal with because things like habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, climate change, agriculture, and lawns, as we learned last week from Owen Wormser, and pesticides are main threats to the viability and resilience of insect pollinator populations. Now, importantly, it's the sort of the cocktail, the synergy of these threats that really undermines pop pollinator populations. But efforts to date have been focused on these two at the bottom, habitat loss, so restoring habitat, and creating pesticide-free spaces for these insects to, to live and grow. And to date, conservation has focused mainly on rural areas, semi-natural areas and rural areas, where there's a lot of open space, farm fields and roadsides, even solar arrays have been considered for pollinator conservation efforts. But to date, these efforts have been insufficient, largely because there's a huge amount of land that's not rural, that's being developed at a rapid rate. And that's cities. It's the fastest growing land use type in the world. And places like New York and Berlin and Toronto um, have been vaulted into the spotlight as places where pollinator conservation might be able to take place. Now, you might be thinking this is ridiculous. How in the world are we going to conserve insects alongside humans? Well, for the first reason, one reason why cities are actually a good option is that they're actually loaded with pollinators. In each of these cities I mentioned, there's over 300 different kinds of pollinators in each of these cities. And so there's the, the sort of the raw material. There's hundreds of different neighbors living alongside us already. So if we can figure out what we can do to support them, we might be quite successful. One of the reasons why cities are so full of pollinators is that they have lots of different kinds of green space. There are backyard gardens and community farms. There's green roofs and parks and cemeteries and even window balconies where you have flowering plants. Now alone, each of these green spaces is not sufficient to support a diversity. But together, diversity begets diversity. And that's one of the reasons why this heterogeneity is, is, is so favorable to insect biodiversity. The second reason why cities are a great choice is that they have lots of people, which are sources of conservation action. Now, two things I know about people in my 27 years of life is that people, one, they care about what they know. 
So they're not going to protect what they don't know, but if you can get them to notice and, and appreciate the things around them, they're, they're likely to, to be agents of change. And the second thing is that people like doing what their neighbors are doing. We are social beings. Oh. Um, and so the question becomes then, can we make pollinator conservation the new norm? Can we take, if you, if you see your neighbor doing lawns and you want to do lawns, well, what if your neighbor does pollinator gardens? Maybe what if 10 of your neighbors do pollinator gardens? This idea that maybe pollinator gardening and conservation could be this idea that catches on like a meme um, could in fact make cities a really great way uh, uh, for conservation to, to spread like wildfire. And so with these two ideas in mind that cities have lots of pollinators and they have lots of people, in 2019, I worked with a few other graduate students to found the Tufts Pollinator Initiative. And our work is in three areas. We create gardens and habitat for pollinators. We do community outreach to work with local, um, uh, with local members on, on, on how to do what, we, uh, what we're promoting. And then we do pollinator science to develop data-driven guidelines to reinforce the habitats we build and the knowledge that we teach. To date, we've planted four gardens over 2,500 square feet of native pesticide-free habitat on the Tufts campus. And it works. We found over 115 days of, of insect pollinators in these four gardens alone. So I'm so curious about what we would be, be able to find if we went further afield and uh, you know, went down into Boston on the Greenway um, or elsewhere. Our gardens also teach people how and why to conserve pollinators. We have interpretive signage and plant labels in the gardens that give people the, an idea of why we've made the decisions we have so that they might be inspired by what we've done and bring it home to their yards. And last, our gardens show that pollinator gardens can be both uh, ecologically valuable for insects and aesthetically valuable. These all are native plants, all incredibly valuable plants for, for pollinators, and they look really pretty. We pick plants that are vibrant and colorful and that are hardy in cities to demonstrate that this is, this is not as hard as it might seem. No matter how much work we do on campus creating habitat, it's only a small portion of the total city acreage. To make a difference, everybody else needs to take a, a part in it. We need this community buy-in to, to make real change. So to do that, we increase access to the resources and knowledge for pollinator gardens. This photo I, I absolutely love. It's, it's a scene from our plant sale last year on Father's Day. We were sort of into it. We we're like, oh, we'll grow some plants. We'll sell them in the community for cheap. And maybe we'll get some uh, participants. We, had, we sold out of 850 plants in 90 minutes. This line extended down underneath the railroad bridge. And at the end of the day, more people attended than we could give plants to. And so what I love about this is that it shows that there's enthusiasm and passion in the community for doing what we're promoting. And all we have to do is find a way to capture and funnel that uh, energy into a positive change. We also teach people about the role of pollinators in their local food systems. So much of the food we get comes from outside of the state. But if we go to local farms, like here uh, at Waltham Street Fields, and, um, and we teach people that the food they're going to buy in the farm stand came from the fields that also contain pollinators, then all of a sudden you have a local connection to the sense of place. And all of a sudden, the city can not only provide a place to live, but sustenance. We also engage Tufts undergraduates um, in research, um, doing independent projects on campus, service learning, planting gardens, and learning how to give back to the community and place-based learning, going out into the gardens and connecting with nature. These, uh, these students in an uh, environmental studies class found a caterpillar of the black swallowtail here on this small Golden Alexander's plant. None of us in Tufts Pollinator Initiative had ever found one of these caterpillars in the garden before, yet the fact that this caterpillar here shows that we're supporting multiple life stages, butterflies as well as their caterpillars. And I, I don't know, they're more excited than I am, but I got, I got so excited when I saw this. Um, and another anecdote that sort of shows the value of getting up close and personal with nature is I was teaching this class in the X College, all about bees. And the first, first two classes, we went out into the gardens and we looked at bees. Um, and a lot of students were sort of struggling to know what was a bee and what was not. And so we got up close with a bumblebee, picked a male bumblebee off the flower and I held it in my hand. And they were all like, aren't you gonna get stung? And I said, well, male bees can't sting. And so one very brave girl, she put out her hand and she started petting it and the bumblebee buzzed and her face lit up with electricity. And all of a sudden, everybody else behind her that was sort of scared also put out their hands and touched it and the bee flew away totally unharmed. 
Um, but for me, it was a moment where I was like, wow, there's no substitute for a living laboratory. I can show you all the beautiful photos of insects on this slide today. But if you go out and you see nature for yourself, then you'll start developing that connection uh, that makes you want to participate too. One of the other ways that I do that is in, in helping get people excited about the nature around them is leading pollinator safaris. This is one of our most popular activities. We go out to a local nature reserve and we see what insects we can find. We had 30 people walking around with us at the Elwife Brook Reservation. And I'm telling you, this was, we didn't walk very far. 90 minutes, we covered maybe 500 feet. And in those 500 feet, we found all sorts of insect pollinators, about 35 species. And we have clearly the enthusiasm in the, uh, in the community to, to do this. One of the reasons why I think pollinator safaris are so valuable is that people protect what they care about and they only care about what they know. And so by developing that close relationship with the nature around them, they're more likely to take action. And I think it's summed out excellent by this Mary Oliver quote, which I absolutely love, which is attention is the beginning of devotion. And ultimately we need people to be devoted to the insects around them uh, in order to make a change. Over the last eight years, I've gotten to know pretty well one kind of insect pollinator, which are bees. Um, and I think I'm gonna go for the rest of the talk. I'm gonna dive into the bees that I've gotten to know because I think it's a great example of, of how much we can dive into a single topic and uncover about the, the lives that are uh, around us. So when you think of a bee, I would not be surprised if you're thinking of the honeybee. In fact, it was on the advertisement for this talk. And so there, there are honeybees that are, uh, you know, they live in hives made out of hexagons. The queen develops on royal jelly. The workers make beeswax and help make honey. They dance to communicate to their uh, workers where flowers are. And they've even been featured on, you know, in popular culture like Bee Movie or even Black Mirror. And you might also know that bees, maybe you've heard, you know, Save the Bees or with a photo of a honeybee featured, featured prominently. And these concerns about honeybee populations have called people in cities to, to create urban beekeeping, right? Put a hive on the roof, raise hives in your backyards. And while these efforts are, are great from a personal standpoint, and you might love getting honey and harvesting beeswax, it's not really an environmental issue because honeybees are not threatened. They're doing just fine. Over the last 40 years or so, honeybee colonies in the US have remained fairly stable despite fluctuations um, from year to year. And this might come as, come as a shock, but it's just an example of how a single species that's doing fine has sort of been uh, perpetuated by the media as, 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 as being threatened. And one of the reasons why honeybees are just fine is because they're managed by people. We have ways of, 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 of splitting hives and, and making new hives, and we're, we're watching over them pretty closely. But the problem goes deeper than that because honeybees are not native to this continent. They were brought over in the 1600s for honey production and beeswax. And raising them and considering them an environmental issue I think is, is, is quite analogous to raising chickens to save songbirds. If we're raising chickens and saying that this represents all of bird diversity, well, that's just, that seems ludicrous. And so why do we represent a single non-native species uh, as being the, the way to save all wild species? So the rest of the talk is not gonna be about honeybees, but I just wanted to clear the air because honeybees are often thought of as uh, the, the species that's in most in dire need and that couldn't be further from the truth. So which bees do we need to care about? Which bees do we need to learn more about to know how they can live alongside us? Well, let's enter native bees. There's 4,000 species native to North America, over 350 in New England, and they come in every size, shape, color, and form you can imagine. There's red bees and green bees and blue bees. There are fuzzy bees and bees bigger than orzo and fairy bees smaller I'm sorry, bigger than rigatoni and smaller than orzo. <laughs> um, these, there are bees that walk on water. There are bees that fly at night. There are bees that know how to sing the way the flowers like to extract the pollen. All of which to say there's a tremendous ecological, economic, cultural, and intrinsic value in our native bees that's worth protecting. You already know some of these native bees. The bumblebee, I mentioned them earlier in this talk, and I'd be surprised if you hadn't encountered them you know, uh, in, a, in a park or in a garden. 
These bumblebees, like honeybees, are social, but they live slightly differently. In spring, mated queens emerge from hibernation, and they find a cozy place to nest, maybe underneath a shed or a grassy tussock, and the female flies out to get pollen and nectar, which is food from, from trees and you know, cherry trees and maple trees, and she lays her first generation of workers underground. These all-female workers then uh, assume the tasks of the colony, and they grow throughout the summer, not feeding on spring flowers, but now summer flowers. And these bumblebees are the ones I was mentioning that know how to sing just like the flowers like. And this is an example of an amazing thing they do called sonication. Here, a bumblebee is vibrating her body at the particular frequency, some say middle C, uh, that um, sort of expels the pollen from the flower and allows her un, uh, unlimited access to the resources inside. The colony continues growing throughout the summer until a point in the fall when they switch to producing new queens and males. The queens and males mate, the queens refuel on, uh, on, on fall blooming flowers, goldenrods and asters, and then find a cozy undisturbed spot to tuck away for the winter before completing the cycle. And I think the bumblebee cycle it really uh, exemplifies all the things that bees need. We need to consider where bees are nesting. We need to consider the flowers that they need throughout the year. Spring flowers won't cut it. We need summer and fall. And we also need to understand about places to, to spend the winter. They have to be undisturbed and they have to be safe. I want to point out that there's some amazing work being done in the, the biology department here with uh, now Dr. Pujesic and PhD students Sylvie Finn and, and Jesse Thuma to understand more about this relatively poorly known life cycle, cycle stage that connects one year to the next. Bumblebee queens need to survive from one winter to the next, but we actually don't know where they live. And some cool things that they're finding are that there's particular spots that queens prefer over others. And so we can dig into this quite literally a bit more. We might learn more about the secrets of what these bees need. Most other bees don't live in hives. They're not social. They're solitary. 75% of, of, of our native bees are solitary, meaning every female builds, guards, provisions her own nest. She is her own queen. And because she's responsible for her own nest, they're very docile because if she risks her life to sting you well, and she dies, well, her entire legacy is lost. And so most of our native bees are quite docile. I want to point out that what I'm going to tell you, it sort of comes from a lot of work that I've done digging into these bees. This is the focus of my PhD, but it couldn't have been possible without uh, my undergraduate mentees, Max McCarthy and Chloe Markovitz and Ben Shamgojin, all of whom have also worked with me to understand the secret lives of these, these bees. So in spring, if you go down to Mystic Lakes on the lake shore, Shannon Beach, it looks just like a sandy, sandy patch. There's some red maples nearby. And on emergence day, all of these bees have queued into the warming temperatures and they erupt overnight. And all of a sudden that barren soil is covered with brawling bees. These are males with their long antennae and fuzzy mustaches that have found a female at the center and they're tussling and toiling over the ground to mate. Females need to mate just once. And after they've mated, she's got no patience for males and she kicks them away and she carries on her life. In the insect world, males are just good for mating. Once she's mated, she finds a nest underground and she digs this long sinuous tunnel one to two feet in the sand and that's hard work. And so she takes rests and she'll sun herself in the entrance and it's just the most adorable scene. Um, but this one scene is not hard to find because with, for every one bee there is, there are hundreds of others. Although they're not, although they're solitary, they like each other's company and they nest in these neighborhoods called aggregations. So each of these little patches of sand is a bee nest, and you can tell it apart from an ant nest because it's, the hole is about the width of a pencil, not a pin. And so each of these females is responsible for her own little volcano of sand. She does it all alone, but you'll find these collections on sandy slopes. She then makes these trips out to flowers. Some of her favorites are red maple and red bud and apples and service berries, all of which you can find here on the Tufts campus and in, in the city. But importantly, they only need spring trees because her, her life is, is spent only during the spring months. Underground in her chamber, she carves out a little nursery, which she first wallpapers with this waterproof lining, which is akin to cellophane, hence their name. Um, and then she deposits a soup of pollen and nectar, which she churns up and down with her tongue. 
She hangs an egg from the ceiling and she seals it off. She'll do this maybe five to 10 more times in her life and then she dies. She'll never meet her children and she's given them all they need to turn into to adult bees and emerge the following spring, which underscores another part of native bee life cycles is that within a month they're gone. And so 90% of their life is spent out of sight. But in order to conserve them, we need to know this about them and we can't let it get out of mind. Other bees don't live below ground, they live above ground. Um, some of them rent um, pre-existing cavities or they'll excavate pithy, spongy wood from stems or they'll even cement together little pebbles that they find with tree sap. Some of these bees will nest in bee hotels, which are man-made cavities that we've cut up and we've drilled holes in. And it's a great way of bringing this bee diversity closer to home. It's a phenomenal PBS documentary called My Garden of a Thousand Bees. If you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend looking at it. And it features prominently the story of, of, a, of a above ground nesting bee in her um, work to, to build a nest in one of these, uh, these cavities. The bees that live above these, uh, above these um, in these above ground cavities need additional things. Mason bees, uh, true to their name, need mud for their nests and leaf cutter bees, true to their name, need leaves. Inside the nests, you have this long linear chamber. Each of these partitions is a single bee and this was made by a leaf cutter bee and these bees are in a, a leaf, a home made out of leaves. These bees are, are resin bees and they're made out of uh, they're in a home made out of tree sap, and these mason bees are, are made in homes out of mud. And so this underscores that not, bees not only need places to nest and food, but they also need things to build their nests with. And this is easily seen throughout the city. I was walking to my advisor's house last summer, and I noticed this curiously cut leaf on the side of the street. And this told me that a leaf cutter bee had been here one, two, three, four, five, maybe six times cutting out discs from the margin of this leaf to return to her nest and make homes for her babies. And so even though I didn't, see any, I didn't see any bees, I knew she had been here. You can use these clues to sort of figure out what bees are up to around you. So bees live above ground, live below ground. They also have you know, very picky diets. Some of them like lots of flowers, like our, our cellophane bees. Others are very picky. Some only visit ironweed. Some only visit tomatillos of all plants. Some only visit sunflowers. But the one thing that's consistent among these bees is if you plant their host plant, they will almost certainly come. And this couldn't be more true than for one of my favorite bees, the squash bee. I'm a vegetable gardener. I love growing food throughout the summer and it wouldn't be complete without zucchinis and pumpkins and butternut squash made possible by these bees. But curiously, squash is, not, squash is not native to Eastern North America. In fact, it's native to the Southwest and Northern Mexico. And the only reason that the, the, the squash bee is here is because humans have an unwavering penchant for, for growing squash. You know, First Nations people traded squash every year um, and the squash bee followed as the, as, and was domesticated across Eastern North America. This underscores that Squash is so central to the life cycle of squash bees that not having squash or not having the right plants for bees can actually limit how much bee diversity you have in the city. The other thing it underscores is that because these bees only go to squash, they're phenomenal pollinators of their host plants. In this case, hoisting a billion dollar pumpkin industry on their backs and making pumpkin pie and all of our fall treats possible. As I said, their lives revolve around squash quite literally. Squash flowers are unique in the sense that they open as the moon, moon is setting in the evening sky and the flowers open before dawn. The squash bees are there ready to go. Males are ricocheting through the gardens and the females are there collecting pollen and nectar for their underground nests. By noon in the heat of the day, the females retire to their nests. It's a long day of work but the males are not, don't know where to go because they're not welcome in the nests. Nests are female only space. And so they go to the next place, best, next, next best place, which is a wilted squash flower. So I don't know how many of you have ever you know, fried up squash blossoms stuffed with ricotta, but if you go out next summer and you're harvesting squash blossoms, before you pick one up, peel it open. There might be a dozing squash bee inside. 
But don't worry, it's a male and they can't sting. Not that they would anyway. I've painted a very happy picture of the squash pumpkin patch, of the squash bee, but there's danger lurking nearby. There's another bee, and this bee needs something that none of our other bees have needed so far, and that is other bees. Cuckoo bees can only reproduce in the presence of other bees, because like cuckoo birds, they lay their eggs in the nests of already existing, already existing nests. This female cuckoo bee, she sits on the side waiting for her opportunity to slip inside. The mama squash bee leaves and the cuckoo bee goes in. She lays an egg and this video shows what she does as she's leaving. She makes sure she wasn't detected. And so she leaves. And make sure that nothing was disturbed. The worst thing that can happen is for the squash bee to detect something is amiss. And when the squash bee comes back, she seals up the brood cell and inside there's a squash bee egg and a cuckoo bee egg. And uh-oh, war begins. And the cuckoo bee egg hatches with these huge jaws, these scissors, and it just slices the squash bee egg and it develops on the pollen and nectar inside. And so from this nest next year, a cuckoo bee is going to emerge. And I know you're gonna say like, oh, screw the cuckoo bee, we love the squash bee. But don't worry, there's karma in the garden, sometimes with eight legs. This is a crab spider that's sitting on a flower, camouflaged and nabbed a cuckoo bee. And it's just amazing. This all happens in like a hundred square feet of your backyard. And so I just wanna zoom out for a sec because when we plant squash or any other flowers that bees need, not only are we supporting that bee, but we're also supporting the bees that need those bees. And we're supporting the spiders and the wasps that eat those cuckoo bees. And we're supporting the birds that eat those spiders and those wasps and those bees. And all of a sudden we have this incredibly fragmented entangled web of ecolog ecological interactions that we've supported perhaps um, sort of without even knowing it. And I hope that by knowing this now, it'll inspire you to go out and see what other things that you can, you can help uh, create in your yard. There's lots of other things you can do to help. Maybe you live in an apartment and you don't have a backyard. There's lots of things you can do to help our native bees. And I've tried to summarize this in five things, seeds. So if you use seeds to save native bees, you can spread native plants, you can employ a life cycle approach, you can eliminate pesticides, you can discover what's around you, and you can share with others. What do I mean by spread native plants? I mean, plant a garden. It doesn't have to be big. In fact, small gardens have recently been found to support as many insects as big gardens. And so if you can have a small patch like this um, or on a roadside or work with neighbors to do a collaborative community garden or add a flower pot to your balcony, any little bit helps. Importantly, I recommend native plants because native plants are what bees are used to. They've evolved alongside native plants for millions of years on this continent. Not only that, Native plants are aesthetically pleasing. They're really quite beautiful to look at, um, contrary to what is often um, suggested. They're also climate forward, they're drought tolerant, and they don't require chemical in inputs. And they're also re reconnected to your natural heritage. I know years ago when I, didn't, I wasn't into this, I couldn't name any native plants, but now I realize driving along the roadside, they're everywhere. And they're part of having a sense of place of what it means to live in Massachusetts. And so by planting native plants, you're starting to reclaim some of that natural heritage and bring it into your own life. I wouldn't be able to give a talk without recommending some plants. And I, these are some of my favorites. It starts in spring with lance leaf coreopsis and foxglove beard tongue. In the summer, we have wild bergamot and mountain mint, just absolute pollinator palooza on this plant. We have uh, Joe pieweed and ironweed, New England aster and golden rods. And I want you to take a look at this collection because this was very intentional on my part. None of these flowers look the same. We have diversity in color, size, structure, form, and most importantly, bloom time. The key to supporting lots of insects is to have a sequentially blooming sequence of plants. So in our gardens, we strive to have a diversity of bloom times from spring when we have uh, maple trees and tulip trees that are already planted on campus. In May, the hawthorn trees and some of the irises begin to bloom. 
And then our garden takes over in June with lance leaf coreopsis and, and foxglove beer tongue and phlox. And this is when we're going to have our native plant sale right in June. So you can get right in with the action and participate with us. And many of the plants you see in our garden will be for sale at, at, in, in June for, for cheap. In July, our garden really starts to, to shine. We have a bee bomb and, and uh, wild golden glow and echinacea. In August, it's just an absolute fest with fountains of goldenrods and culver's root and, uh, and joe pieweed. In September, the garden, I think, is equally beautiful. It's beginning to tire. The grasses are beginning to change color. And this is my favorite part because I also get to work with undergraduates and we do this place-based learning. A garden that stopped blooming in June, it would not be possible to look at bees in in September. And so one of the reasons why we make sure we have a long bloom time is that no matter when you visit the garden, there's something for you to see. In October, you might be like, ah, oh, this is pretty ugly. But I also love the October garden because it's a time when there are seeds. And we go out there and we collect seeds and we stratify them and germinate them for, for, for growth next year. And November through March is the hardest time to be a gardener because everything is covered in snow. But it's also a time for contemplation and reflection and to get excited about next year's growing season. We're only like six weeks away. And so you can source native plants from our sale or from this great blue stem natives in Norwell, Garden in the Woods in Framingham, or Prairie Moon Nursery Online has a whole selection of plugs and seeds that you can use to get started um, uh, in, your, in your own projects. The first E is employ a life cycle approach. You know, if we plant flowers, that's great for adults, but that's only 10% of the life cycle. We need to make sure there are safe, undisturbed places to nest stems that aren't cut down for those above ground nesting bees and undisturbed places to hibernate for bumblebee queens. There's a great movement, hashtag leave the leaves. And if you leave the leaves until May, that ensures that an entire generation of bumblebees will be fully connected from spring to spring. The second D is fairly quite simple. It's quite simple, it's eliminate pesticides. Anything that kills a bee, anything that kills a mosquito also kills a bee. And there's a, this is a great opportunity to get involved with your local government um, and petition to ban pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids, which are particularly insidious from residential use. And there's a big win in Massachusetts that in some places, these neonicotinoids are going to be banned from use on, on, on home yards, which is a, a, a really great uh, pioneer grassroots movement that, that was started over the last you know, five, six years in the state. So it's possible. It just takes a lot of take time and, and, and effort. D stands for discover what's around you. I can't stress this enough. Literally stop and smell the roses. And you might find that there's already a bee smelling the roses before you. You know, engage your senses, get down to the level of, of flowers. Notice interactions. What happens when a bee and a butterfly land on the flower at the same time? Do they share? Does one kick each other off? Take notes and, and, and take photos. You know, there's a great community online in iNaturalist that is willing to help you identify what you've seen. And you can always send emails to, to Tufts Pollinator Initiative. But I, I, I really love seeing what people have, have been watching. And the last is S, share with others. To save native bees, it really takes a hive. Um, and and if, if you go out and you tell people what you've learned today or what you find on your own or join communities in the, in the neighborhood like Earthwise Aware or Green and Open Somerville or the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, or Mystic Charles Pollinator Pathways, you might be able to, to find other like-minded people and really make an effort to, uh, and collaborate to make, a, to make real change. If you've drifted off, as sometimes I did as a Lunch and Learn student, I'm going to bring you back for like a minute just to leave you with a final parting words. So going into this, right, although cities might seem like the last place that conservation could occur, especially since there are so many people and so many cars and just so many lawns. Look around because there's already millions of bees and other insect pollinators living alongside us. They're hiding in plain sight. They're living wild and unnoticed. And if we pay attention to these insect pollinators and these bees and we, we listen carefully and we slow down from time to time and introduce ourselves, we might be able to learn from them the things that we can do to help. Now, these aren't big things. They're small, intentional, respectful acts, like planting flowers throughout the year, or telling the pesticide company we're not interested, or teaching a child that bees should be revered, not feared, 
meaning each of us has the agency at the end of the day to keep our cities full of cloudy winged mining bees and pugnacious leaf cutter bees and two spotted longhorn bees and metallic green sweat bees and aster mining bees and denticulate longhorn bees and golden northern bumblebees and so, so many others our fuzzy winged neighbors, which can, in return, if we allow them to, enrich our lives and nourish our bodies and help us grow more sustainable cities. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you, Nick, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, we have a few questions online, but I, I wanted to invite the people in the room if they have questions, just raise your hand and we'll pass you the microphone as well. Okay, so uh, I will start with the first question online from uh, Kristen, who asked, how do you decide on which species to sell at your plant sale? She's interested in trying to host one as well, uh, where she works, and she would love to, to get any pointers. That's great that you want to have a plant sale. So we've, um, we've, we've collected data in our gardens of, of which plants are visited by which kind of pollinators. And we've also looked at, we've planted the diversity of flowers. And we've also seen which ones do well in a city environment. So I think the way to pick really comes down to, to, to spending some time noticing what, uh, what insects, uh, what, what plants are attractive to insects and what does well in, in your site conditions. We have lists online as well as the list here of plants that do particularly well in, well in cities. And I think these would be a good starting place. Um, I think a real key to getting people excited about this is for the plants to flower early and be very hardy, right? No one wants to mess up and try for four years. So the plants that we pick also consider that like lance leaf coreopsis and, and mountain mint are, are very hardy and guaranteed to bring pollinators in. Um, it's one thing to plant, you know, spring ephemerals and, and uh, that might get eaten by rabbits, but that's another thing, right? Make sure they don't get eaten by rabbits um, because you don't want all your hard work to go, go away. I'd be happy to answer like in more detail the specific plants, but a lot of that can be found on our, our website as well. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Victoria Antonino, who I assume mm -hmm. is in Somerville, and she asked if you guys are well, are uh, welcome partnerships with the city of Somerville to create new gardens in, around the, all the parks, especially around um, um, Father House Park, where there's so much lawn. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Tori. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, absolutely. I don't know. I, I think Powder House Park would be perfect. It's close to campus. Another thing that I've really been excited about is we have this new Green Line extension coming through Somerville. And is there a way of making that way of a corridor for people, also a corridor for, for pollinators um, and have signage along the pathway. Um, I think those are, that's a really awesome opportunity there. And so yeah, happy to chat more about that. Any plans uh, here at Tufts to expand your operations? Yeah, so we, we just got funding from the Tufts Green Fund for two more years of, of work. Um, and we're hoping to expand uh, to at least three more gardens on campus um, particularly to increase the visibility of what we do, um, not just at the end of Boston Ave, but maybe, you know, in other places where campus tours are, are passing. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question from Paula Jordan. How can I stratify seeds now that uh, we're safe from the garden? Iron weed aster, Joe, Joe pie weed. How to stratify seeds? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so for those that you don't, that don't know, stratification is basically the process that needs to take place for seeds to germinate, right? So a seed that's produced in the fall, the temperatures are very similar to spring and the light levels, the day lengths are very similar to spring, except there's one thing is that you have a whole winter and if you germinate in fall, it'd be very bad. And so plants have this sort of built, built in mechanism to prevent germination in fall. And all that needs to take place is a certain number of days of cold to break that germination. Plants need a winter hibernation. And so some plants need 30 days, other plants need 60 days of cold, other plants don't need any cold at all. Um, and so knowing that about your plants is, is key to, to knowing how to germinate them. 
And a lot of that information is actually available on Prairie Moon, Moon's website. Um, it's, getting, it's getting a little late in the season, right? So like February now, 60 days would take you to like early, early April. So I would say if your seeds aren't out already, I would get them outside. Um, you can just put them on, you know, if you cut a milk jug in half, fill it with some soil and you sprinkle your seeds on top, that'll give plants the winter experience, they, the seeds the winter experience they need to germinate. Thank you. And now I want to give a shout out to Meadowscaping for Biodiversity, um, who is an environmental education program which brings youth out to design and install native plants for property owners. Uh, Barbara Pacero, who I assume is part of the organization, uh, would love to, to work with you in the future and show you their garden. So maybe I'll connect the two of you after the talk. Absolutely, Barbara. Um, Okay, another question. Anybody in the room, please feel free to raise your hand at any point. Um, Rosemary asks, if you have a very small plot of land to work with, do you recommend more of one plant to create a patch or a diversity in a small area? Great talk. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I always recommend um, at least three different plants in a small area and picking those plants with respect to when they bloom. So one that's a early summer, one that's a mid to late summer, and one that's a fall, right? So you might pick landsleaf coreopsis for, for early summer. You might pick swamp milkweed to help monarch butterflies too in the summer. Then you might pick New England aster for the fall. And so all of those plants sort of vary in size, shape, ecological function, color. Um, of course, one plant is better than no plants at all, but I think to, it, it's quite simple to, to extend that blooming season uh, for, for many, many months by picking a few different plants. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Consuelo Almodovar about phenology. So she wants uh, you to comment on the effect of climate change on uh, the disconnection between the emergence and uh, I guess flower uh, blooming. Yeah, so I, I didn't really go into much about how these different things were affecting bees, but you brought up a really good point that yeah, climate is warming and bees, like these cellophane bees, they time their emergence based on temperatures. And so one thing that we're seeing um, over time is that bees in spring are emerging earlier and earlier. Now, this might be okay if flowers are blooming at a similar pace earlier and earlier, or it might be really bad if flowers are emerging, uh, blooming much faster or much slower. Right? This is the idea of phenological synchrony, right? Are the bees matched in time with their plants? Now, there's, there's actually not a lot of compelling evidence that mismatch is occurring widely. We know that bees are emerging earlier. We know that plants are emerging earlier, but I don't think it's, it's one of the main threats to, to bee populations. I think a far more concerning aspect of climate change is the, um, the, the warming of winters, and the intensity of heat waves and droughts on populations. Bees have limits to their physiology. If it gets too hot, they just can't live. If it gets too warm over winter, well then they might lose fat and they might not be able to survive when they come out. So it's, it's sort of like a very catchy idea of phenological mismatch, but I'm not convinced by the evidence so far that it's the most concerning um, part of climate change for bees. Thank you. I have a question here that I think we'll, many people will relate to. And this is from Dino. Uh, they are asking that they're having a hard time giving up lawn uh, to plant a mm. pollinator friendly garden. So they are, uh, so I guess their compromise is to allow clover and, and dandelions to grow. Uh, but they are asking whether, is there anything else they can do to keep the lawn, but make it more pollinator friendly? Mm. I guess I, I feel like I, I hear two things in there. One is that if you want to keep lawn and keep it short for playing on, yeah, there's actually lots of ways that you can integrate sort of, I guess, clovers and short growing nectar plants, right? Grass provides no nectar for bees, but things like clover um, or, or, or little mints can also provide nectar. So we, there's actually like bee friendly lawn mixes you can buy. And those plants aren't necessarily native, but they actually make your lawns uh, a, a, you know, a grocery store for bees and allow you to keep playing on them. The second part of the question that I heard is how do I get rid of lawn if I want to and convert it into a garden? And I, sorry, lawn... I think the question is how can they keep the lawn? Oh, how they, but... then the first part of the question is that's the answer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but but yeah i think if you want to come in yeah yeah i mean you just be aware right all of a sudden you have bees in your lawn you're going to also have potential to get stung right a bee doesn't want to be stepped on i said they're docile but like any animal that gets stepped on is going to try to escape right and so you might consider playing with borders of your yard you know not mowing the borders and applying that seed mix to the edges so that you can have part of your lawn devoted to, to insects and part of your lawn devoted to play space okay uh, since we're running out of time i will just uh, end with a, a a quick question uh, from our audience uh, from katie uh, hutchins and she asked what is your favorite bee my favorite bee oh my goodness um i just say what comes to mind it's gotta be the squash bee it has to be the squash bee because it, they're, they're always there in the garden. They're always there greeting me. Like I come in ready to pick them in. There's squash bees bouncing around. And I, it, it's the sign of summer for me. Like there's, there's no such thing as pumpkins or, or zucchini or ratatouille without the squash bee. And I, I love eating and cooking. And so, yeah. Thank you very much, Nick. There are still uh, quite a few questions. So I encourage everybody to contact Nick, uh, the email that is on the screen right now. And I'm sure he will be happy to, to talk to you. Right, Absolutely. Nick? Absolutely. I okay. love it. But thank you, Nick, one more time. Thank you so much. And see you everybody next week.